everybody and welcome to the Theatre Pitch Podcast. My name is Jem, this is Jo. Howdy. And on this episode we have a very, very, very special guest. We have Ban the Man. How are you, Ban? I'm good, thank you, Jem and Joe. How are you? I'm really I'm, good. I'm good. You know what? I'm pretty excited about this is, I think, the first um, glasses only episode of Theatre Pitch. Yeah! Oh my goodness. And we... Let's um, all just take a moment to appreciate that by discussing the important issue. I don't know if I've ever asked either of you to um, short or long sighted, or I just can't for see reading. Far away, whatever that. Means. Yeah, yeah, short sighted. Okay. yeah, that's what I am as well. Yeah, same, same. Yeah, I, yeah, I can't see far away. Or, uh, are you both the same? Where if you take your glasses off right now, you can't actually fully see each other. Oh, no, no, no. No, I can, I can see. Or are you I not that bad? That. Yeah. No, I just, okay. I just have them because if I don't, everything's a little bit fuzzy, and I get annoyed. I just but, have them because I, I didn't want to put makeup on today, so glasses. But hey, <laughs> let's make something a bit clearer. Gem, what's this podcast about? This is the Theatre Fitch podcast, the podcast where, despite the fact that I've got a cold, I'm going to keep pon- powering through. So apologies, everybody listening to this episode, if one or two coughs make it into the final episode, or if my voice is just harsh and hoarse as all, as all crap. Uh, but this podcast is the podcast where each of us theatre makers take a random online encyclopedia article and each of us turn it into a theatre show and we pitch how we would turn it into a theatre show then at the end we smush them all together into some kind of megatron fuzzy thing oh. to create the mega ultra ultra pitch live so joe what is today's episode about what is the um, thing that we basically <laughs> turn around to batten and said hey are you free on this day to record and do you want to record? And oh, by the way, here's a really meaty article to do that to. Yeah, it was. Uh, it's a bit of a madness. <laughs> I mean, I'm just happy that um, Sean wasn't here to hear you describe it as um, d- that a Megatron is formed by smushing together. Um, I mean. Sean's not here, so I can start making all of the like bad references to Power Rangers, and I could be making mistakes about all of those things, and not risk the most pedantic argument ever. <laughs> I do love Power Rangers, though. To be fair, look, Sh- Sean will eventually launch a Power Rangers podcast. It's inevitable. You can discuss it with him on that. Can I? Can I please be on that one, Sean? Please, please let me be on the Power Rangers podcast. Yeah. Can I be left? Can I just... but, yeah. um, but we're not talking about the Power Rangers today, because no. today we're talking about Millennium Challenge 2002. What, what? Millennium Challenge 2002 was a major war game exercise by the United States Armed Forces in mid-2002. The exercise, which ran from 24th of July to 15th August, cost $250 million, about $360 million as of 2020 in terms of inflation, involving both live exercises and computer simulations. It was meant to be a test of the future military transformation, a transition towards new technologies that would enable network-centric warfare and provide more effective command and control of future weaponry and tactics. The simulated combatants were the United States, as referred to as Blue, and a a fictitious state in the Persian Gulf, often referred to as Red, though characterised as Iran or Iraq. I love that last bit. It's just needless racism just for the sake of it. Like America. Um, Cool. It's, I mean, when when, when I said a meaty argument, like article, I I, I genuinely didn't dull it down at all. This is such a wonderfully meaty, I don't know, for me, I'm super curious by all the different war games and what if situations. Um, So this was super fun. How did you guys find this article? As always, super easy. <laughs> ten out of ten, smashed it, mate. Uh, yeah, yeah, d- yeah. No, no. Um, I had to figure out what a war game was. I didn't realise that armies actually do these things. Like, kind of crazy if you think about yeah, it. Yeah, elaborate and very, very expensive training exercises. Yeah, it, and, yeah, and yeah. I, I've got to be honest. When I read through the article, there was a bit where I'd thought to myself. 
I'd completely forgotten the bit at the beginning where they said it involved computer simulations. I was just like, they shot at each other's ships. How did they not die? And then I was like, okay, not real ships. Yeah. 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 Also, yeah. no idea where all that money went. Like, how? Uh, th- th- I mean, who needs that much money for a simulation? Age of Empires exists. It does. It, I mean, it really it, does. It, it it is the age old question as to you know all militaries around the world, which is where does all the money go? Um. So, uh, who wants to go first? Because I'm going to be honest, well, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm trying to figure out a different pitch in my head because I genuinely want to put mine on. I really genuinely am like quite passionate about this, this pitch. Well, um, I'm going to be nice as you're our guest here and ask you, Ban, would you like to go first? Bear in mind, you can say no. Okay, um, probably not. Just because I want to see how you pitch yours, Joe, and then I'll come in in the middle and be like, "Bow, there enough. I am," with the with the with the you know tactician war game, you know, right on the nose, like right it. there, you know. So, okay. jo- I'll go jo- first jo- then. Yeah. Uh, okay. My question, Joe, is: Is yours fun? Uh, it's always fun with me. Yes, okay. fun, Joe. <laughs> It's just the question of whether, because so, I mean, I'm gonna be no, yeah, go, go first, go first, Joe, go first. Yeah. So, uh, my idea is based around the fact that from this article, we all got that essentially, the commander who was leading the Red Forces, had actually managed to outthink the Blues, but then they stopped and restarted the war games, purely because this was less an exercise in actually demonstrating this. And more in showing the US beating this um, Gulf force of unnamed origin. And it was essentially a propaganda exercise. Whereby they were like, no, no, you were winning. Let's restart it. And this time, don't win. Which to me, made me think a lot about something that I'm surprised I'm bringing this up when Sean's not here wrestling because essentially I felt like there's an interesting notion here in the fact that one of the kind of jokes within the world of wrestling fandom is when people say it's fake right being like it's it's not actually fake it's predetermined and I thought especially considering the way we've seen American politics go of especially uh, a former unnamed president of uh, orange skin and shit hair, um, was accused of being a kind of more a wrestling figure than he ever was a politician. What he was doing was getting the crowds riled up by getting them popping, by making local references, by playing them off in an us-against-them style. It's what he was essentially doing was practicing a form of wrestling promotion politics. And I think this, in its own way, becomes emblematic of that in the way that they decide that actually, despite the fact that someone's showing how being given the weaker technology, actually thinking about the situation and not being reliant on it allowed them to outsmart it, only for them to be told... No, don't think that much. So I want to explore this notion of predetermined outcomes and the way that it was never actually meant to be a fair fight. It was only ever meant to be a demonstration of something. And what it proved was that thing didn't work, but that doesn't actually um, change anything. Like... um. So I'd started actually reading the document of the report based on this War Games before oh, I realised it was rep. 750 pages. <laughs> wow. But but the bits of it did remind me of the condensed version of the um, uh, the terror report published around Guantanamo Bay that I have actually read. Um, that, was, that was even longer. Fucking hell, that was long. Um, But basically, what it established was that um, within American methods of um, kind of like 
I forget what the terminology they used. It was something like um, extended interrogation techniques. Um, but basically, torture. Um, th within the torture methods they were using, none of them were actually effective at getting evidence from people. But because they had established they were doing them, they had to continue doing them to make sure it didn't appear that they were wrong to have done them in the first place. So this is the sort of thing of exploring with this is telling the story of this war games going on and the fact that they're essentially funneling so much money into it in order to prove that it was right to funnel money into this and how they are just doubling down on their worst excesses because the one thing they cannot do is admit they are wrong. And I want this all to play out as um, it's actually played out as a series of wrestling matches, which is why I introduced that, involving the United States military essentially wrestling itself to try and prove a point that it can't because it has to rig the match. You know, it has to get someone like to come in and distract the ref. And it has to have the person with one hand tied behind their back in order to actually get the pin to prove that they could do it. I love how angry that is. That is very, that is quite angry. That that is a bit maddening. I, you know what though? I feel like the guys who are like the generals have really good wrestling names. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, <laughs> you know something oh, like that. Like yeah, I I could genuinely see most of these names being like K Van Riper. Or if you called him K Van Ripper, that's a wrestler right there. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought it was Ripper, so go for it. Um, I, so I, I don't I, know I, if it's Riper or Ripper. I'm going for Ri for Ripper. So Why not? Are, in your show, yeah. is it? I'm assuming you've got your wrestling ring in whichever uh, venue you're going for. In your show, is is it like the wrestlers? Are they dressed as soldiers and are they in guys in uniform wrestling or is it like you know uh your your president wrestler are we getting are we getting trump in a circle or is it all like just a a a, a metaphor well yeah i i was thinking of yeah playing into that so there is a grand history of things like um uh fans of like 80s 90s wrestling will know that there was a feud between a guy dressed up as like a, an American military wrestler called Sergeant Slaughter who was wrestling against a man named the Iron Sheik. And that in itself was, uh, let, let's just say, not a culturally sensitive storyline. <laughs> um, and um, so I was thinking of playing in on that and in the history of wrestling itself in being connected to these things in weird ways so like playing into the fact that the the actual um the announcement for many people that um Osama bin Laden had been shot was made on Monday Night Raw because um J Dwayne Johnson had a hookup at the Pentagon that had told him um of course he did is what is the story did. I've heard <laughs> But yeah, and playing into this kind of weird connected history of the military and wrestling and yeah, having like, you know, kind of a guy coming out in um, dressed as Uncle Sam as kind of like the final boss wrestler. Um, and just, yeah, playing into it in this way of having it be kind of this examination of American politics and American military politics specifically but through the form of a pro wrestling show. Great. So I've got one other question. Do you have a regional theater in mind? Well, um, I'm actually going to uh, shout out um, one pretty close to home, which is that uh, a couple of years ago, now um, a company called Breed Pro put on their first show at the Abbeydale Picture House here in sunny Sheffield. So I feel like where better to launch this than in the picture house. Brilliant. 
Ben, do you have any questions for the pitch? Um, what would you call the show? Um, <laughs> how have we um, done? Well, so many seasons of this podcast. Yeah. And that's never just come up as a standard question. Oh, is that, is that a really good? Sorry, I mean, sorry. Am I not I'll to... throw in a title? But... Am I not allowed no. to do that? No, it's okay. No, I just because like, it, it, I, I do I, have I'm an aware answer. Of it. I'm I'm so aware of it because I'm so bad at naming things that if you'd asked me to name anything that I've pitched on this show, I will default to whatever comes out of Joe's mouth next. Um. Which, uh, Sean, um, if you're listening to this, this might be a great time to show some pictures on screen right now. But uh, within the world of professional wrestling, there is a match type known as War Games, whereby um, it is two rings back to back surrounded by a cage. So I'm thinking of just calling this and basically the poster can be done up like a wrestling show. And just calling it Millennium Challenge War Games. Sounds excellent. I love it. Yeah. I love it. You know, you've got me sold there, Joe. Sign me up. Where are the tickets? When, when, when are they being on sale? <laughs> uh, uh, are going on sale? I'll, I'll let you know. If you leave your email with me afterwards, I'll add you to the pre-sale code. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you so much, man. I do. Don't forget to tick the little box. <laughs> oh, yeah. You do have to sign up for the mailing list. Just to let oh. you know. <laughs> Oh no! Okay, I'll give you my email that I don't really use. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Ban, I believe you said you were going to try and uh, come in second, uh, yeah. having seen how it goes. Yeah. Okay. And All right. we've heard yeah. rumours that you've uh, you you've got a you've got quite a few pitches in your mind, don't you? <laughs> I did. Um, this one is basically an amalgamation of all of the pitches. Oh, so we've got a smush straight off the bat. I like yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Like okay. It. Like, okay, so okay. we're going to be smushing a smush. Got it. Yeah, you're, you're smushing and you're, you're, you're doing that that noise. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, okay. So um, my pitch isn't really like a normal theatre play. Like it's it's kind of like an escape room. However, the escape room has two sets of audience members two sets of participants and both of them have to work against each other to see who will win the war game so each side has um the general who will explain to them how the game works and aid them in defeating the opposition so one of them will be impersonating uh van ripper or Riper, or whatever we're calling him and the other one is going to be the ripper the ripper the ripper one, paul the ripper or the Ripper, <laughs> and then the other, the blue team is going to be um, an actor is going to be impersonating Mar- uh, uh, Marty Meyer, and then so they're going to basically explain to them their own tactics. So each each general will have a different tactic of how to how to play the game, basically. And the way that the actual game will work is as follows: each team will be shown a different battle plan, and it's up to the the uh, participants to actually implement the plan as well as they can. They'll use an edited version of... Um, have you guys ever played any, like, uh, Total War games? Yeah. Mm. The game series. So have you guys ever seen Time Commanders? The okay. game show. The actual, like, BBC game from back in the day. No. Sorry to say, I have not either. No. Okay, so Time Commanders was a game where a game show... Uh, I think it was hosted by uh, Richard Hammond back in the day. And then they relaunched it with... Um, Greg Wallace, you know, the buttery biscuit bass lad. Uh, <laughs> um, basically, this pass. this game show was um, a set of contestants would go onto it and would have to uh, have a a battle from history and had to try and, like, change the outcome of that battle. Okay. So let's say they were Napoleon in the Battle of Waterloo and they would have to win that battle instead of yeah. not winning it. Stuff like that. So um, I would get the people who make the Total War games to actually make a specific game just for this uh, escape room thing. And then each of the um, contestants would then actually play that game against each other. So they would each have a tactical screen uh, that they would like basically like touch. It would be like a touch screen where they can like change where the troops are and everything. And then there'll be like a big screen in the middle of both of the sets of players. 
basically showing the actual game in action. Oh, amazing. So obviously, or as we know in the article, like crap happens. So halfway through them playing this game, a glitch will happen where everything will crash and like the the uh, actors will basically like become themselves and be like, oh, what's going on? Let's go and try and sort it out. And then when they sort it out, like it comes out as basically saying like whichever team was winning would then it would be like flip over basically like the teams would like flip over so whoever was winning is losing and whoever was losing is now winning and then two people who are impersonating the um uh, uh the generals would actually like fight each other but they wouldn't fight each other in the normal sense i think what would actually happen is they would like get rid of their clothes into like wrestling gear because you know i have to take something from joe's magnificent pitch and then uh they'll actually go on like gladiator podiums and you know that gladiator fight where they oh. like that massive oh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah they, have they have to like, try and knock each other off with they have the to try big, and knock each like... other off with the big things and then i think what needs to happen then is like each of the sets of audience members would then have to have a go at knocking each other off. <laughs> and whoever wins that then wins the whole thing. Oh my goodness. Obviously, I... you know, this is going to cost a lot of money though. So <laughs> I don't know how we're going to raise the money. But I one thought... other thing that yeah. needs to happen is we need to have these guys in it. I want to sh- I want to show you these guys. Have you? Uh, do you guys know what this is? Is Oh, no, it's not going to... Oh, it's working. Yeah, it's working. Oh my goodness! For anybody who's just listening, um, if you have seen any of the uh, the like car sales, secondhand car sale things in American movies, and you've got the, the it's a wavy waving inflatable arm flailing doom man. It's a waving man. That's a wonderful. <laughs> so yeah, I thought I'd bring a prop. Uh, one of my other ideas was basically to have all the contestants against each other, like a Hunger Games kind of thing. But then I thought they might actually end up trying to kill each other. So maybe that's not. A good yeah. Thing. Yeah. Fun, fun enough, I did have the thought the other day of I thought what would be funny would be do a competitive escape room where um, you're competing to see who can get out first. And whichever team gets out first, the losing team has to watch on a video screen as they get out, go back to their cars and leave and get away in time to avoid the traffic uh gem do you have any questions for my random <laughs> i don't I, I i genuinely i actually really really like it i like the idea that you've got the glitch i mean i'd start to question getting everybody up on doing a gladiator thing but at the same time as a, as somebody who has lots of memories of um as a kid every party was a gladiator party with a giant inflatable and like big sticks with foam on them and just like beating the crap out of my sibling and like friends and uh, them getting their own back when they eventually got big enough and scary enough to wallop me. So, mm. and that was still fun. Yeah, I I was going to pitch, yeah, based on that one suggestion for the show actually, which is what about if they they get up there and the two generals are kind of fighting on these stands and then there's a bit where it's planned so they both knock each other off at the same time. So then at that point, they say, um, they ask for one volunteer from like, uh, or like, you know, a volunteer or two from the audience to basically stand in as their champions to determine which side wins. But then it's basically like the setup is left there and they stick around after the show to just say, if you want to go, you can still have a go on them. Just turns into so, a party, just like Gatsby yeah. does. So so that it's like, there's the opportunity for, one, the storytelling bit to be uh, kind of done as neatly as possible, but also for, um, you know, not to force anyone to do anything they don't want to, but to give them the opportunity, if they do, not to miss out. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah, that's actually probably a really good I point, like Joe. That. And then that will be a lot cheaper as well than making like ten different arenas. <laughs> exactly. You only need to build <laughs> one set then. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. Love it. Okay. Um. So if there are no other questions, I will bring the mood down. 
<laughs> oh no, but the, oh, but it's you know it's got to be fun episode with me in it. You know, I... it is fun. for me. This is super fun for me. I got to really flex. So uh, when I. Oh no! You you you're gonna like strap a, a GoPro to a drone, aren't you, or something? No. As a statement no. about drone warfare. There are no GoPros that I can think of that are involved, but so when I read this article, I I got very excited and I immediately had an idea and I was like, oh, this is the best idea ever. Oh, I can so see it happening. I can see it so clearly. And then I went, oh, I can see it so clearly because I've. I've seen this performance already and basically in my head I'd I haven't personally seen it uh but I studied it at university um the company Blast Theory did a uh performance Desert Rain in 1999 that was like this digitally interactive immersive installation that where you, the audience kind of were made into soldiers and they went and you encountered um holographic projections of soldiers with their stories and you played war games and it was discussing the various different wars that had been happening uh leading up to that and i went oh great so i've just repitched that um and i sat for ages trying to figure out well how can i change it despite the fact that this is a performance that has had such a profound uh impact on me and i think of this this thing that i've never even seen like quite often uh, and then I thought it would be so relevant now anyway. So then I thought instead of trying to come up with something completely new, I'm just going to do Blast Theory's Desert Rain. But for now, I'm going to modernize it. Um, because we are currently, unfortunately, uh, in quite close proximity with a war that I think most people would have thought, most people might have a little bit of themselves that are quite surprised that there's a war happening with actual guns and that it's not just completely virtual it's not just completely online but we are living in in, in a quote-unquote hybrid digital war currently and uh we we live in hope that in the time that it takes for sean to edit this podcast that the war is ended um so i want to my 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 um theatre pitch, my pitch, my show, happens in, you know, you get those buildings that they're both sort of office and business as well as residential buildings. And it's like the big high rise buildings. It's going to happen in one of those. I'm going to take over one of those. And because we're modernising this and we're taking a look on modern war, the audience start with a personality quiz. So everybody takes an online personality quiz and that assigns you to various different parts of the building. So we're going to section the audience off and um, we're not going to tell them exactly what group they've fallen into. But the groups are basically going to be um, the perspective of a soldier, a journalist, a commander, in, um, an everyday person and any others that we think through the development of the show might be interesting. But it's perspectives. Then what we're going to do is they're going to we're going to take these groups through into the various different parts of the building that is more relevant for them. So the everyday person goes into their living room. Uh, the commander goes into the war office. The soldier sits um, behind the drone banks. Um, so every situation and the journalist is sitting there in their studio. So we're going to press these these people up against the war and the story of the war will be the story of this war game. Uh, but we're not going to tell anybody that it's this war game. We're not going to tell anybody that it's fake. We're going to lead them through the events of, of how this war, quote unquote, was meant to happen. But we're going to press them up against that, but keep them distanced, very much distanced. Uh, because I think that that's very much how we experience, unless you are on the on the forefront, especially right now in the Western world, we experience war whether it is the Ukrainian Russo war or whether it's, um, you know, we've been fighting a war since 2001. Uh, we've, most people have experienced it from afar. Um, and I'll come back to that for like the actual reason, but we feed everybody the prop, the right propaganda that they need to be that person. And what, what I want them to do is also make choices. So they are those per, per, that, that person. So they make a couple of choices throughout the show um, that, 
makes them feel like they are having an influence, makes it feel like it's, it's, it's choice, but it's not. We are taking them through this. And I want specifically for each of them to have one fatal choice. So like, for example, the everyday person, that fatal choice that they all make is like signing a petition that is to execute somebody. Um, for, for the journalist, it's deciding to publish or pursue one line of inquiry. For the commander, it's to go and, you know, do these different things. And for the soldier, it's it's to blindly follow a set of um, uh, commands. And then once they've made this final fatal choice, so once we've really locked them into this narrative, we're going to pull the wool over their eyes, or at least we're going to pull the wool out from their eyes. And we're going to bring everybody back together and we're going to actually play them the truth um, and show them and run them through their series of events, but the actual truth of it. Uh, uh, so it's not the soldier who thought that they were going and freeing people. It's uh, it, it's actually the invasion. It's not the, even up through to I'm really wanting to have that that commander position to really illustrate that even the people at the top of the game can have the wool pulled over their eyes, can be doing things that they think are right, but are actually it's all about perspe perspective and propaganda, um, and. I mean, how this links back to the article is not only are we using the narrative of of uh, the 2002 war game, but also that idea that like this, the, the, this feeling that you get where it was, this was all just manipulated. I was manipulated to be here and to bring everybody to, together at the end to say, no, whatever the hell you did, it didn't matter. This is always going to be you know, it was manipulated, it was from some other force. And I really want, for me, I'm kind of like, the point is really to get the audience to really question war and question your role within war and how it can all be fake, it can all be a game, but to really question um, that idea of why do we go to war? Because ultimately, war is always someone else playing with a littler guy's life over an argument that's got no effect on the little guy, but will ultimately upheave and up overhaul their life. Um, so sort of wanting to really inspire that question of like, who are you on the chessboard and what moves are you going to be making? Um, so yeah, that's my pit. So I, I just wanted to check one thing, which is Jem in th this is giving me worryingly stamford prison experiment vibes you're not actually going to be messing with people to the point where they start torturing the other people are you no 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 i i did think about that and i was like there is there is an ethical question behind this and i feel like i want it to step up to the glass of that but not actually not not touch it not get too close, not lick the glass, not go through the glass. Um, I, I, it, it, it's, it's about giving people and facilitating those choices that we find naturally, but aren't, aren't going to torture you, aren't going to cause trauma, but just meaning that like, you know, I think the majority of us, especially listening and especially today, we engage with war through petitions. We engage through war through, we, through memes, through news articles, through propaganda at its highest level. And ultimately, that is all just, you know, I've been in a lot of conversations right now about how like social media fuels our own extremism and like how how we interact with things that are actually affecting people's lives and saying, OK, well, let's take these basic things and step up to the Stanford exper experiment enough to have a bit of an impact so that when people encounter this again, they sit and go, ha, huh, am I being fed actual accurate information let me go double check my sources um but not have them sit there and get like full-on ptsd when they're asked to sign the petition to release the war prisoners but yes i was very very much aware i was very very much aware of like the prison experiments and like the press the button and you'll hear the screaming but like you'll get paid if you press the button despite the fact that clearly it's torturing somebody no we're not we're not stepping into like the 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 the, the, the horrible grey ethics of 1970s and 60s uh, psychological experiments, no. I, I'm somewhat relieved and also, I've got to be honest, 
also somewhat disappointed. disappointed. Yeah. Yeah. I'm relieved. I'm not disappointed with that. <laughs> Joe, you're a mean guy, okay? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's you. you. Ban, you, you've seen every episode of this multiple times. You know this. I'm the mean one. That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's my that's my pitch. Uh, any any questions? Um, my questions were mostly ethical based. So yeah. Yeah, I really really want to put this show on. I I do like it. I do like it a lot. Um, I think my question is more just how many audience members do you think you would have in each production i think per group about 10 to 15 you know that like and that there, there's also the thought in saying well you can play around with that because ultimately joe's right that there is a there's a level of psychological experiment here and mm. i'd want to do a lot of more research into you know um crowd-based psychological theory because i don't want it to turn i don't want it to turn into that that sensation where we're getting the crowd riled up about something like because i feel like that would totally distract from the point of what i'm trying to say like i'm trying to sit there and go question the propaganda don't question the crowd hmm. you know it's 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 question the information you're fe- you're being fed rather than playing with that idea of your primal brain and your instinct to follow society and like that that's that's too deep you know i think ultimately war is about there were there was kind of one of those things where i did want this to be raising funds without the audience knowing until the end that all of the proceeds go towards helping uh refugees of war uh because ultimately for me i don't care what you're fighting about the the people who are being affected by war are those who are being yeah left without a home it's the, it's the people who are being forced into refugees or forced into horrible living conditions and that's who i want to be ultimately a, a focus on in that lasting message of going we'll be on all and end all this was all to try and support them and to highlight that um as that final nail in the coffin of consequence um but yeah so small a small group but not so small that you feel like it's it's vulnerable. Okay, I am. Um, I really like the fact that you're gonna raise money for refugees at that point, because then I think it's like you're, because I guess people would actually be thinking about their actions, thinking, oh, but we did really bad things. But then at the same time, if you're then saying, oh, but you've actually raised money for this, then it might make them it make it make you feel a bit more like lighthearted in the end. Yeah, and I mean, I kind of thought, you know, there are some people who will probably sit there and throw a tough because, oh, I don't want to support the refugees, and... I actually like that. I would not be surprised. I think there are people, but I would be very... There's My my sense of humour would be to make somebody feel that, but then be like, you can't say that. Like, you literally... To say that is to recognise how devilish you are. And how like horrible you are. So, but I like there are people out there who will sit there going, "Oh, I want," or, or they'll sit there and say, "I wanted to go to certain refugees, but not other refugees, uh, because racism." <sighs> Literal racism is not nice. Yeah. So the anarchist in me is like, "Don't tell them that this is raising money for those charities because." Well, no, okay, you know what. Okay, in, if you actually put on this play, can I be the one that like has a? Um, can I be the voiceover? Be like, "Hello, everybody! Your proceeds, the proceeds of the money that you have raised, is going to this." Yeah, easiest audition ever done. I I was gonna say what you should do, Gem, is have at the entrance two doorways in one saying, "If you would like your proceeds to go towards the refugees, enter this way." One saying if you would like your mind to go solely towards the um like the artist or something, go this way. And then if you go that one way, it just says, Ha, ah, fuck you, it's going to the refugees anyway. Yeah, 
I mean, for me, I, I, I genuinely, I got excited when I was just like, yay, I'm starting another play with a personality quiz. Because that went so well last time. <laughs> well, exactly. Um, I do have one more question, um, which is, are we ready to get to the smush? We are going to cut to the smush. I think Ban did a Actually, job. the answer is, no, you're not ready to cut to the smush. Because... We've got a fourth pitch to incorporate. That's right. We don't have uh, Sean Brady with us, but we do have Sean Brady's pitch. Ooh. Okay, so this is my second voice note. Um, I'm going to do this really quick because I didn't realise that the voice notes on Messenger cut after a minute. They do, and yeah. I rambled on for quite a while then until I realised. Okay, so... Um, Ah, condensed idea. Okay, so um, big, big, big Wikipedia article. I'm guessing Gemma's going to do something really serious that's going to try and tackle wars bad. Um, he nailed you there. <laughs> Come on. He, he, he nailed you there. I am personally attacked just by the truth. Sean, you nailed that one. I'm glad I'm, glad I'm predictable. Probably phone in something about a song that he's just made up and it's not gonna he's i don't know with joe who knows okay so my uh, and i gotta say sean off the mark there come on try harder i actually put an effort this week you win some you lose some idea yeah. is i've really got a really good idea but i feel like the story of this is based around that retired general who came in he's like yeah I'll just do some tactics. And they're like, no, you can't do that tactics. And he's like, but you just said to do some tactics. I'd base it around him and his story and try and make it a David and Goliath sort of thing. Boom, one minute, I'm the best. Bye. So, yeah, let's, uh, we've now got our smush. So we have Joe's wrestling show. We have Ban's escape room that turns into a wrestling show. That I so admire because it's going to make the smush slightly easier. We've got my all too serious thing about oh war is bad. Um, that is perspectives of war propaganda thingy, and then we have Sean's focus on the general in a David and Goliath epic story battle. I think I can smush your guys and Sean's thing together. I have no idea how to put mine in there. I think well, I could probably go, like, first half of bands and mine. But the wrestling, I don't know how to put it in there. What do you mean? What happens is the personality quiz then proceeds where you go in terms of who, which wrestler you're, you're putting your money on. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Money from the proceeds of that go towards the refugees. Yeah, there, therein lies it of... Um... You know, people who listen to the previous OFIT D podcast that existed for, I think, three episodes and has since been scrubbed from the internet um, will know that we introduced Gem to the terminology of there are within wrestling faces or baby faces who are the heroes, also known within Mexican wrestling for fun fact as Technicus, and there are heels who are the villains, aka Rudos. Just uh, keeping this bilingual for fun. Um, But essentially, it's most pure wrestling comes down to that good versus evil struggle. And I think there is something to be explored there in this notion of... They often say with these things, the best villains are the ones where they believe they're the heroes. And exploring this notion of within the the Gulf War conflicts, within the Iraq War, the later conflicts in Iran, in the Middle East in general, America very much positions itself as and considers itself to be the face in this, valiantly fighting for what is right against a, an evil enemy. But looking at is it that simple as binary stating that there is a good guy and a bad guy or that even things like um within it that stating that the one general is david and that the other force are goliath fighting against him and exploring how with all these things 
you know, even down to just like ending on a battle on gladiator podiums, all things kind of try to break it down into a black and white, good versus evil, us versus them type mentality. And how that is pure what I was saying about Trump's style of politics. And I think philosophically, there's a way of uniting all four of these ideas under that. Yeah, I think there's something in adding, you know, maybe it's, there's an element about the propaganda as well of like, uh, mm. maybe we we do like a pre-show where you're told the story of all of these different um, wrestlers that you're about to see the big um, s- slam down. I'm just going to start making up words and hope that they're, they're, they are related to wrestling, but they sound like they're for, from wrestling. So. I'm almost certain there's been a wrestling show called The Slam Down before. If there <laughs> hasn't, somehow we've failed. Yeah, I mean, Every... I, think, I think it's also a Spice Girls song. So. Yeah. I mean, I think it, like if we do a pre-show where um, you're kind of introduced to the... the um, these characters that you're about to see the show with uh but you're introduced like it's it's literally just as you're in the lobby and there are like people going around telling you about it mm. so your your perspective of, of of one character could differ depending on like if you encountered a fan of them or a hater um and then like you go in and you see you see all of the the intro bits and and, and stuff like that and it's that idea of, oh, okay, we play with the black and white, but also you have the the resonance of going, I thought you were a good guy. Hmm. Okay, so we've come out of some serious escape room style war games with a wrestling show. It's very O for D. And um, don't don't worry, um, Ben. If you were thinking there's not enough escape room in this, um, you uh, I don't think this episode will have been released by the time we're recording this. But uh, look out for um, other escape rooms over this season of uh, Theatre Pitch. It's been a very also specifically for anyone who's watching this, as it will have been released by this point. Just go back and listen to the episode about Tor Total. It will make sense by now. I was just going to say, like, in this smushing, we definitely need some more merchandise. Oh, there oh, will be yeah. so much merchandise. Um, so one thing I think let's discuss they, it. They do well. Um, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Are we discussing the actual merchandise? Yeah, yeah, we're going to break it down. So there's got to be, like, um, we're all agreed, there's got to be, like, those kind of cups, like you get at the cinema with the different toppers, yeah? Oh, hell yeah. And foam fingers. And you've definitely got yeah, to be able fingers. to buy your own metal. Like, buy your own metal. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What about um, actual uh, set, the actual set design as a, like, a sculpture that you can, like, have at home? And if, I don't know if a machine could do this, like, you could buy yourself as an action figure. Yeah, yeah, and then you can, you can have, like, what? the set and then put yourself into the set. Yeah. What, like, have a 3D printer there that just, like, prints your head in front of you and puts it onto just, like, a a standardised action figure, like, soldier body? That is better than trying to print the whole of you, as I as I was about to pitch. So, yes, that's yeah. better. That is obviously going to cost you £3,000 for the one figure. But, you know. And yeah, about yeah. four and, hours of your life. Uh, also, if you're listening to this and you're going to make that as an idea, um, we own it now. Sorry. Um, guys, while I load up the randomizer to find out what we're going to be talking about next week, possibly with Ban, possibly not, who knows, um, I thought I'd just say you can find OfitD online on our socials, which I think are just under OfitD, aren't they, Gem? Yeah, and you can also go to our link tree, which is linktr.ee forward slash OFITD. Yep. Or just type in OFITD link tree. You'll figure it out. Mm. But, uh, Jem, if they want yeah. to specifically find you, where could they do so? You can do so on Instagram at OFITD underscore Jem with a J. Uh, or you could just type in Jem Rolston link tree. And you'll find everything that is to know about me, except the bits that I don't want you to know. And uh, Ban, do you have any socials you want to plug at this time, or any uh, um, things in general? 
I it's, think it's I think very everybody possible to say no, don't find me. Should go and subscribe to the Brothers Robinson YouTube channel where I've done a few videos on there. Uh, you can see me shooting bananas at people and uh, talking about random stuff. And yeah, they, they've won a few awards for some random stuff that they've made, which is excellent. Um, you can also, you know, follow me on Instagram, but I probably won't follow you back just because um, I, I, I'm really weird with Instagram. Like, I have to have a very specific amount of followers, which, to be fair, I'm going to increase that by a couple now by following Gem and Joe. But uh, I've got Instagram at ban the Greek man, you know, all one word, all lowercase. But yeah, you can follow me. Lovely. You can see Don't my worry. random. Joe, where can we find you? Oh, yeah, Joe. Well, you can find me at not Joe Ranch. Yeah, that's <laughs> N-O-T-J-O-E-R-A-C-Z-K-A. And you can find me there on Twitter, Instagram. Sorry, Ban, you've just followed the least updated twi- Instagram page, I'm pretty certain in mine um and yeah on my twitter there's also links to my link tree to find out all the other things i've got going on at the moment uh but do you know know what we're going to be having going on next week on uh, the pod hugo louis byers hugo ludwig hugo brackets louis byers was a German-Australian gold miner and politician. Wonderful. Are we going to Texas? Where Where was he from? Um. Well, uh, his... I'm just going to read you the biography section now, just because. Um, after his parents died in West Prussia from plague, he immigrated to America, arriving in New York City age 13, not permitted to proceed to the California goldfields because of his youth, he then journeyed to Australia in 1856. Um, Wow. So, yeah, we are talking the son of Prussian parents who moved to America in his teens after his parents both died of the plague, then moves to Australia and... um, Yes, yeah, starts mining for gold. And also, you'll get to hear about the fact that he got married in a double wedding where his sister also got married at the same time. What a wow. lad. What a way to save some money. <laughs> <laughs> for a gold and, miner. And, and also, more interesting things for you, his sister married his mining partner. Oh, well, it's going to be some wonderful around the world in eighties day, eighty days, mildly incestuous stuff for the next episode. Yeah. But this episode, thank you everybody for listening and watching. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Ban. You've stepped up to the plate and you smashed it out of the park. Thank, thank you for having me. Hopefully, I can come back one day. Oh, you will. Yep. Yeah. And Sean, if you're listening, lad, come on, man. Where are you? Like, you need to be here, man. What are you doing? Yeah. What are you playing, lad? I love you, though, man. And to everyone listening at home, as we say every week, knock it out the pitch, everybody. Mm